Claudia just mentioned, a great time to be talking about how close are we to finding dark matter. Um, because tomorrow is International Dark Matter Day. So um, do check out our department Twitter feed. We're going to have lots of great content about dark matter if you'd like to learn more about, about what you hear about in my talk today. OK, so the outline of my talk, I'm going to first talk about what is dark matter and what do we know about it. And then second, I'll talk about how we look for dark matter. And finally, I'll talk about how the search for dark matter has developed new tools for science and how these have spread out beyond fundamental physics. What are the other things that, that these experiments are used for? So the story begins um, with observations of galaxies. So very quickly, let me first say, what is a galaxy? A galaxy is a collection of stars and gas that are gravitationally bound together. So this is an artist's rendition of what a galaxy like our own might look like. And actually most of what you see in this picture, most of the mass of this galaxy that we can observe by looking through telescopes at photons coming to us from these galaxies, most of that mass is actually the gas, hydrogen and helium gas. And a smaller percentage is the stars. So the first observation of dark matter came in the 1930s when an astronomer named Fritz Wicke made observations of a gravitationally bound cluster of galaxies called the Coma Cluster. And so what this picture shows is an optical telescope observation where all the bright spots in this picture are each one of those is a galaxy. And this galaxy cluster is gravitationally bound together. And the interesting thing about what Fritz Wicke did was he developed a new way to measure the mass that was gravitationally bound in this cluster of galaxies. So the original way to do it is to look at, you know, how bright all these objects are, estimate how much they weigh and come up with a, a mass estimate for this galaxy cluster. And he developed a new method using the Virial theorem, where by measuring the speed at which galaxies move, he could uh, infer, based on their velocities, how much mass was interacting gravitationally. And so this used the, Vir the Virial theorem to relate the kinetic energy, the energy associated with motion, to the potential energy, the energy associated with gravitational binding. And the amazing thing was that this new method implied that there was about 400 times more mass interacting gravitationally than you would infer from the observation of how bright these objects were. And so this was a mystery that was around from the 1930s. And he hypothesized that maybe there was some dark form of matter that doesn't interact with photons that was interacting gravitationally. And it wasn't until an astronomer named Vera Rubin came along and in the 1970s invented a, a much more precise way to measure the velocities of stars inside of spiral galaxies that we had confirmation of this dark matter picture. So this kind of top right image shows an artist's rendition of a spiral galaxy. And so what Rubin did was she picked out a star at a certain distance from the center, which is called the radius of the star, and measured how fast does it orbit around the center? That's the rotation velocity. And the plot on the bottom right shows the, the rotation velocity as a function of distance from the center for an example galaxy. And the data points are the points with error bars. And the prediction from you know, Newton's theory of gravitation was that if you, you know, just assume that these objects are gravitationally bound and predict how fast they ought to be going as a function of the distance from the center, you get the kind of falling dashed line, which is labeled disk. And actually, I, I used to ask this as my UCAS interview question to derive this uh, when we did UCAS interviews. And what you can see is that that falling line labeled disk doesn't look like the data points, right? The data points are kind of flat up to very large radii. And so this was a big mystery, but you can explain this beautifully if one hypothesizes that this luminous disk of stars and gas sits inside a much larger halo of particles that interact gravitationally but don't interact with light. So we hypothesize that there's a dark matter halo, and that's the curve labeled halo. And if you add that halo contribution together with the disk contribution, you get the straight line that beautifully models the uh, observed distribution of the data. And these kinds of measurements imply that there's a factor of 100 times more mass interacting gravitationally than is visible. So what we know today about how much dark matter there is in the universe 
comes from measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So our model of the evolution of the universe is that it started with a big bang and then the universe expanded and cooled. And we can see the photons left over from that big bang as they've expanded and cooled and that's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so there have been a series of wonderful experiments. This is an image of one of them called WMAP, um, which started actually when I was about your age. <laughs> so this is kind of the first, first measurement, um, which what you see in this map is a map of the universe in temperature. So red spots are hot and blue spots are cold. And the difference between red and blue is absolutely tiny. This instrument was sensitive to 10 millionths of a degree Kelvin difference in temperature. And this is a map of the galaxy where our uh, solar system runs across this, right, right across the center of the map. So you see in this top left picture, the bright red part. So looking at one frequency band, you can sort of see the plane of our galaxy right across the middle. And this experiment did a very clever combination of measurements at different frequencies in order to subtract out the foreground radiation from our own galaxy. And so what we're left is a beautiful picture of the cosmic microwave background. And the main thing you notice here is that, you know, it's clumpy, right? There is some, you know, spots where you have more red and spots where you have more blue. And based on the clumpiness of this measurement, one can infer what the composition of the universe is, how much of it is dark matter versus visible matter. And so kind of coming back to this picture, we think the universe started with a big bang and roughly 400,000 years after that big bang was the last time this cosmic microwave background radiation interacted with anything else. And since then it's just sort of expanded and cooled off until we make our measurement of it today, 13.7 billion years after the big bang. Now fluctuations in this cosmic microwave background probe the composition of the early universe because the different components uh, of the universe act in different ways. So matter wants to clump together under the influence of gravity, right? Matter particles are attracted to each other and they want to clump. So in this cartoon in the top right, you can think of the matter particles as being like those orange balls rolling down inside the surface of a ball. And it's that slope that's pushing the two balls towards each other. That's modeling what gravity is doing. But on the other hand, radiation has the opposite effect. When radiation gets too close together, it exerts a positive pressure. It wants to get away from, you know, one, one radiation particle wants to get away from another. And so that sort of acts like a spring in between those two balls, which when you compress it too far, it wants to bounce back. And so we have these two competing effects, gravity and pressure. And that's what gives rise to the clumpiness of this map. And based on how clumpy it is, we can infer the size of those two types of contributions. So I'll show you the summary of what we've learned from that kind of in a moment. But first, I want to say one more word about kind of direct evidence for the presence of dark matter. And that comes from gravitational lensing, which I think is just an amazing phenomenon. Um, so just like when a photon, you know, travels through space, its angle of travel can be changed by interacting with a medium. So for example, if you wear glasses, a photon is bent by your glasses so that it focuses onto the right part of your particular, particular retina for the image to appear in focus. That's an example of a photon trajectory being changed by a change in the index of refraction of the material that it's traveling through. Well, the theory of general relativity tells us that the presence of mass warps the shape of spacetime such that the path that a photon follows is also changed by the presence of mass in a very similar way to the path of a photon being changed by the presence of an index of refraction change. And so the uh, image that's shown here is an image of this lensing effect occurring because of gravitation, occurring because of the warping of spacetime due to the presence of mass. And so what you see here are some galaxies that look like nice round blobs and others that kind of look like horizontal smears. They're smeared out into lines. And those are actually lensed images where a photon from some object in the background is bent by the gravitational effect on spacetime of an object in the foreground and smeared out into an unphysical shape. And so using very sophisticated programming, we can infer which images in this field of view are lenses. And based on those, we can infer the distribution of mass that's doing the lensing. And so this was a very famous observation in 2006 
um, called the bullet cluster, which was heralded as you know, direct proof of dark matter. So this is two colliding clusters of galaxies, the little one on the right plowing through the big one on the left. And this is a composite image of data from optical telescopes. Those are the galaxies that you see as kind of bright spots. X-ray telescopes, what, what these telescopes are sensitive to is X-rays emitted when the gas present in one galaxy cluster interacts with the gas present in the other galaxy cluster and heats up and emits X-rays. And these uh, X-ray emissions are highlighted in pink by an artist. So the brighter the pink, the more X-rays you see. And then finally, gravitational lensing analysis was done on this optical field of view to infer where most of the mass in these galaxy clusters is. And that's highlighted in blue. And so the important distinction here, the important point about this image is that blue is not in the same place as pink. <laughs> so I said earlier that most of the mass of galaxies is made up from gas, hydrogen and helium gas. And what you see here is that most of the mass of these galaxy clusters is not where the gas is because the X-ray images tell us where the gas is. And so this is really fascinating. This shows that most of the mass in these galaxy clusters is in a different place than the gas. And so this was heralded as a direct astrophysical observation of the presence of dark matter in these galaxy clusters. So putting it all together, everything we know from astrophysics, um, putting it all together, we've evolved this standard model of cosmology where the energy density of the universe is distributed according to this pie chart. So roughly 0.03% of the universe is made of heavy elements like we're made of and the Earth is made of. Another 0.3% is made of very light particles called neutrinos. Half a percent is made up of stars. Roughly 4% is made up of free hydrogen and helium gas. So all of that adds up to under 5% of the universe. Dark matter, which interacts gravitationally, but not with light, makes up roughly 25% of the universe. And the remainder is something even more mysterious called dark energy. Um, and so these uh, fractions that are shown in the top right corner show the uh, fraction of matter on the top line, dark matter on the second line, and dark energy on the third line. And I think the point I wanted to make to you here is that the error bars are quite small. And so these are not, you know, these are not statistical flukes. <laughs> we know with a high degree of confidence um, that the particles we know and love only make up about 5% of the universe. And roughly five times more than that is made of dark matter particles. So what do we know about dark matter? Well, first of all, we have some, you know, we know it's optically dark, right? We don't see it interact with photons. Um, and so that's actually a very good hint that it's probably electrically neutral. All of the electrically charged particles we know about do interact with photons. We know roughly its energy density. Um, and the reason why all we know is its energy density is that we don't know how much individual dark matter particles weigh. So their mass is unknown. And we know that dark matter's interactions with itself are very, very weak. In that bullet cluster picture, you could see, you could infer from where the gravitational lensing centers of mass were that the dark matter hadn't slowed down as much as the matter particles that emitted X-rays. And so this tells us that the interactions of dark matter are much weaker than those of the ordinary matter particles that we know about. We also have some picture from rotation curve measurements of how dark matter is distributed. And so a cartoon picture of our galaxy uh, is shown here where we have you know, the disk that we can see from stars and gas that interact with photons. And we're roughly you know, seven kiloparsecs out from the center. And we think um, if that disk extent is about 15 kiloparsecs, we think that the dark matter halo of our galaxy extends up to 10 times farther. So most of, our, most of our galaxy is actually made up of this dark matter halo. Okay, so that's what we know about dark matter. How does that fit together with what we know about particle physics? So I showed you the standard model of cosmology. Now I'll show you the standard model of particle physics. So our picture is that everything is made of atoms and that atoms are made of electrons and a nucleus, that the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and protons and neutrons themselves have three particles inside called quarks. And we think that quarks are elementary point-like particles. We think there's nothing smaller than them inside. And so this picture um, shows us the constituents of the standard model of particle physics um, made of quarks, leptons, and force-carrying particles that mediate the interactions of these other particles. Um, and my colleagues later today will tell you about the one that's missing from this picture, which is the Higgs boson. So are any of these the dark matter? Well, 
we know that you know the dark matter interacts very weakly so it can't be these two and we know that dark matter is electrically neutral so it can't be any of these because all of those particles have electric charge we know that the dark matter is uh, stable it's still around in pictures of the universe from 400,000 years ago and in observations of the universe uh, today so it's not the z boson because that uh, is unstable and finally we know that it's heavy so the great news is that dark matter is probably none of the above and so another way to look at this picture is that we only understand roughly four to five percent of the universe and so we have a, our work cut out for us to figure out what the rest is made of so uh, there are many many candidates for what dark matter might be so this plot shows on the x-axis, the masses of dark matter candidates, and on the y-axis, the interaction probability of those dark matter candidates. And the colored regions in this plot show different classes of theoretical models. And I think the main takeaway is that there are models for what the dark matter might be that span over 40 order to orders of magnitude in mass and over 40 orders of magnitude in interaction strength. So this is really a wide open question. And my research focuses on experiments that look for weakly interacting massive particle dark matter candidates, or WIMPs, which are shown in this kind of purple blob here. So I'm gonna focus on, in the rest of my talk, um, WIMP dark matter candidates and how we look for them. But it's worth keeping in mind that it's a wide open story and dark matter might lie in a totally different region of this theoretical parameter space. Okay, so in the second part of my talk, I'm gonna go on and talk about how we look for dark matter particles. So in, there are several different kinds of experiments that look for dark matter. So I've already talked about experiments that observe uh, the cosmos, and these kinds of experiments can look for dark matter particles to annihilate with each other and produce particles we can see, for example, electron-positron pairs. Um, and a famous example of an experiment that looks for dark matter in this way is the alpha magnetic spectrometer or the AMS experiment, which is located in the red circled area on the International Space Station, which has got to be one of the coolest locations for an experiment. We also try to produce dark matter particles in high energy colliders like the LHC, where we look for collisions of protons to produce pairs of new particles, and we can infer their presence by looking at momentum imbalance in the detector. And then finally, there are direct detection experiments where we look for a dark matter particle labeled chi here to scatter off of the atom in uh, the nucleus in the atom of an ordinary uh, material, which we try to observe the energy transfer to that struck nucleus in a very, very sensitive detector. And that's the kind of experiment that I work on. So the signal in a direct detection experiment is the uh, struck nucleus. So dark matter particle flies in hits the nucleus, transfers some momentum to it, and flies off again. And what you can see is what that struck nucleus does in your detector. Now, the tricky thing is that there are lots of other background processes that can mimic this very tiny signal. So photons can scatter off atomic electrons. And if an experiment has some probability to misidentify an electron as a nuclear recoil, then this can be a background process. Neutrons can scatter off of atomic nuclei in just the same way. And the probability for this neutron scattering process is about 20 orders of magnitude larger than the dark matter scattering process. So this is really looking for a needle in a haystack. Certain kinds of radioactive decays uh, can produce recoiling nuclei with about the right amount of energy that we would expect for a dark matter interaction. But usually these are accompanied by other forms of radiation like alpha particles or electrons so we can identify them. And finally, neutrinos. Uh, can scatter off of atoms in a very similar way to dark matter. And this process was observed for the first time just a few years ago. So what an experiment can measure when a dark matter particle, shown here in red, hits some, the nucleus of some atom sitting in your detector, shown in blue, uh, dark matter particle flies off. And then what that atom does with the momentum transferred to it is that it bumps along into other atoms in your detector. It may heat them up. It may uh, put those atoms it hits into excited states where it may ionize electrons in those atoms, or those excited atoms might emit de-excitation photons and produce scintillation. So the three signatures we can measure of one of these collisions are heat, ionization, and scintillation. And the amount of energy that we're looking at is incredibly tiny. So what we can measure is the kinetic energy 
of that struck nucleus as it recoils through the detector. And to kind of put this in terms of units you're probably familiar with, it's sort of the highest energy dark matter induced nuclear recoil you might expect would have an energy of 10 to the minus 16 joules. Now this is a measurable amount of energy. It's about a thousand times bigger than the energy of you know, one visible photon, and we can see visible photons, but it's about five orders of magnitude smaller than the energy released in the fission of one uranium-235 nucleus in a power plant. And these amounts of energy are absolutely tiny you know, compared with everyday uh, energy scales, say how much energy a flying mosquito has, or how much energy it takes to lift an apple one meter. Um, so these are very, very small numbers, and that's part of why these experiments are really hard. And so if we put it all together and look at what is the likelihood of these interactions, how many might you see in an experiment as a function of energy? So this plot shows the rate of interactions as a function of energy, and this is for a hypothetical WIMP, dark matter WIMP, with a mass about 100 times that of the proton, and a cross-section, an interaction probability that's just about at current experimental limits, maybe a little larger. Um, what you see is that the number of events you expect to see is sort of between one and 20 events per ton of detector mass per year of doing your experiment. <laughs> so we have to detect very small energies in our detector, and we have to detect very rare processes, right? One event per year, per ton, you need a lot of patience to see a big signal from that. And so these different curves show different targets that are used in dark matter experiments, xenon in purple, germanium in blue, argon in yellow, and silicon in pink. So these are commonly used elements in dark matter detectors. So you need a lot of patience uh, to be a dark matter exper experimentalist. So this tiny event rate um, is also what makes these experiments tough because anything else that flies in, strikes a nucleus and flies out um, can fake a dark matter signal. And so the smallest dark matter scattering signal you might see in an experiment might be one event. And if we compare that with likely event rates for possible background processes, um, that's about 100,000 times smaller than the background interactions you might expect from photons scattering off of atomic electrons, and about 10,000 times smaller than natural radioactivity backgrounds, and about 1,000 times smaller than neutron scattering backgrounds, and maybe even smaller than neutrino scattering backgrounds. So this is you know, really a, a needle in a haystack problem. So what experiments do about it is work incredibly hard on rejecting backgrounds to a tiny dark matter signal. So you've, you might have seen uh, a photon scattering detector. So a Geiger counter is a kind of a detector that can detect photon electron scattering events. Um, and you know, if you put a Geiger counter on your desk, it might measure something like 10 million photon scattering events per kilogram of detector mass per day. And so experiments use lead shielding um, to block these photons to get that number down to uh, the you know, relatively small scale shown on the right. Um, to deal with radioactivity, um, if you live in an area where there's granite uh, in the bedrock, um, you might be familiar with radon as a source of radioactivity. And uh, in certain regions of the country, you have to have radon detectors in your basement, which would, the alarm in that detector would go off if, if that exceeded about 200,000 radon decays per kilogram per day. And so in order to mitigate these backgrounds, experiments are built out of very high purity materials where we control the radioactivity um, of every component that comes anywhere near the detector. Um, in order to reduce backgrounds coming from neutron scattering, experiments are done in underground laboratories, one to two kilometers underground, in order to shield detectors um, from neutrons associated with uh, cosmic rays and solar activity. And then finally, neutrino backgrounds, there's not much we can do because the sun shines 100 trillion neutrinos at us per square centimeter per second, and maybe one in a million of these, uh, one in a million events per kilogram per day, could be backgrounds to dark matter searches. And so this means that ultimately neutrinos set an indistinguishable background to the sensitivity of dark matter searches. And I'll talk about one of the ways that we're trying to get around this. And this beautiful image is a picture of the sun taken neutrinos by the Super Kamiokande experiment. And really the sun is a single pixel at the center of this image. It's just the experimental resolution of the neutrino scattering process and the measurement that turned it into kind of an extended blob here. So the best experiments are somewhere here, and I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a moment in terms of sensitivity to interactions. But first I wanted to comment that this is a very um, hot topic. There are many experiments operating all around the world trying to be the first to discover dark matter. 
um, located, you know, even in Antarctica <laughs> and in underground laboratories all over the place. This is a very hot field and very exciting and competitive. Um, and so how close are we? Well, this shows on the x-axis dark matter particle candidate mass. And this is a narrower range than I showed you before because we're just thinking about WIMPs here, WIMP candidates. And on the y-axis, this shows the dark matter interaction probability. And this is normalized in a way that we can compare experiments on uh, xenon with experiments on argon with experiments on germanium and silicon. And what this plot shows in the solid lines are regions of mass and interaction strength parameter, parameter space, which have been excluded at uh, what is called 90% confidence level by experiments. And so basically the region above and to the right of these solid curves, we think dark matter doesn't exist there. Um, now, I said 90% confidence level. What that means is if I did the experiment, you know, 90, if I did the experiment 100 times, 90 times out of 100, I would observe a consistent result with this. I wouldn't find dark matter in the parameter space above and to the right of these solid curves. Um, and so that's a, a measure of experimental certainty. Now, I also showed you that neutrino backgrounds form a, an irreducible background to these kinds of searches, and that's shown by this gray hatched region. So this is the region below which neutrinos become an indistinguishable background. And so our task really is to figure out how to cover the region between the solid lines and that gray neutrino floor. And there are lots of um, experiments that are under construction, proposed, or about to turn on, which are aiming to do just that. And the projections for the sensitivity of those experiments are shown in the dashed curves. So probably, I would say, 10 years from now, we will have covered a good chunk of this remaining open parameter space. And either we will discover dark matter, or we will learn that we're looking in the wrong part of the parameter space and, and dark matter lies elsewhere. So this is a very exciting time because I think, you know, if dark matter is a weakly interacting massive particle, we stand a good chance of finding it within the next decade. So I'm gonna go on now and talk a little bit about the kinds of detector technologies and what they've brought to society. And I'm gonna focus on sort of two technologies. One is experiments that have very, very low energy threshold and those focus on uh, relatively low mass dark matter candidates. So those are shown in this orange square. And then there are experiments that are very, very large. They're large mass experiments and they focus on reaching the smallest couplings in this space. So I'll kind of talk about those two categories next and how those have brought us new tools for science. So the first dark matter detectors were cryogenic bolometers. These were uh, detectors that measure heat, ionization, or scintillation in crystals, which are operated at temperatures as low as 10 millikelvin. And these have been operated using germanium, silicon, uh, calcium tungstate. And these are relatively small detectors. They'd fit in your hand. And when a dark matter particle interacts, kind of shown by that yellow bang, uh, both phonons and ionization are produced. And those are measured by sensors, which are very, very sensitive to tiny changes in temperature. So they can measure that tiny amount of heat as well as charge electrodes, which can measure a charge produced in those interactions. And by comparing those two signals, the amount of heat versus the amount of charge, experiments can reject background interactions coming from radioactivity at the surface. There are also experiments using the same scheme that measure scintillation and heat. And so these are pictures of some of these detectors. So you can see in the kind of top picture, um, this device is sort of a, you know, you could hold it in your hand, it's about the size of a hockey puck. Um, in order to operate these uh, stacks of these detectors are assembled into towers shown on the left. And then those towers are operated um, inside of cryostats shown on the bottom left at order 10 millikelvin, so incredibly cold. Um, there are also very tiny versions. Uh, you can see someone holding one in their hand and a picture of the you know, assembly that is from a detector that measures scintillation and heat is shown in the top right picture. So these are very attractive little detectors. Um, and the key point about these is that by measuring the ratio of ionization to phonon yield as a function of energy, they can tell the difference between photon-like events, which is what all this data is shown here, versus where you might expect dark matter to be, which is shown between the red curves at the bottom. And so these experiments managed to reject backgrounds by uh, factors of nearly a million using this technique. And this technique is now employed beyond dark matter. So this is a, it's, it's employed uh, in gravitational wave search experiments. So this is a picture of a, of a gravitational wave experiment at the South Pole. It's employed in experiments that are 
uh, operating in space, the Herschel Space Observatory, which told us much of what we know about galaxy evolution, uses these kinds of cryogenic bolometers. Um, experiments studying the curvature of space-time, like the boomerang experiment, that have made really important contributions to uh, our standard model of cosmology, employ this type of detector. So these have had very wide impact across science. Another type of detector technology that's employed for dark matter searches is the time projection chamber. So in this kind of detector, dark matter particle flies in and hits an atom. So here it's an atom that's part of a CF4 molecule or freon. And in this cartoon, dark matter particle knocks one of these fluorine atoms off of the molecule, transferring some momentum to it. And then that fluorine atom bumps along and ionizes other CF4 atoms along its path, creating electron ion pairs. And this is operated with, in a strong electric field that drifts the electrons one direction and the ions the other direction. And then there's a region called the amplification region of even stronger field, where the electron may be accelerated over one mean free path to an energy above the ionization threshold of the gas. And so one electron turns into two, which turns into four, it turns into eight, and so you get avalanche multiplication. And that produces a source of scintillation light and electron current along the particle's original track. And so if this is a, a low density medium, one may be able to actually reconstruct the track of this dark matter induced fluorine atom. And so experiments employ very low pressure gases to try to do this. And the idea is that the dark matter fluorine scattering looks a little bit like this billiards game shown here. So in an elastic scattering interaction, when the dark matter particle, the cue ball, <laughs> hits the fluorine atom, uh, the yellow striped ball, the uh, recoiling nucleus is going to travel forward with respect to the direction of the dark matter particle. And so in this elastic scattering interaction, uh, what you expect to observe is a direction correlation between the projectile direction and the recoil direction. And what this figure on the bottom left shows is a CCD image of exactly this. So this is neutron CF4 scattering, where we reconstructed using a CCD the ionization produced along the track of a fluorine nucleus in a low pressure CF4 detector. And sure enough, the direction of this track is correlated beautifully with the direction of the incident neutron beam. So this is kind of a proof of principle demonstration of this approach. And the reason this is interesting is that as we travel around the galactic center, we are traveling through the dark matter halo of our galaxy. And so you can think about there being a wind of dark matter particles traveling opposite to our direction of motion. And so we happen to follow the Cygnus constellation. So we can think about it as the dark matter wind blowing from the direction of Cygnus. Um, and this is exactly the same phenomenon as, you know, when you're driving in the car and you stick your hand out the window, you feel like there's a wind blowing opposite to your direction of motion. And so if we had detectors that could measure the direction of the dark matter induced recoils, we could look for a dark matter source in the sky. And so this, this big uh, cartoon is a simulation of what the dark matter sky would look like, where this big blue spot is showing us events coming opposite to our direction of motion. And this would really be unambiguous proof if you could correlate your WIMP-induced nuclear recoil signal with our motion around the galactic center through the galactic dark matter halos. This is kind of the holy grail of directional detection. And if you could do this, you could tell the difference between neutrino events coming from the direction of the sun versus dark matter interactions uh, coming from the dark matter wind opposite to our direction of motion. So here are some pictures of small scale dark matter detectors, the first one ever looking at directional dark matter detection is in the Bulby Mine, um, which is outside of Whitby in Yorkshire. Um, there's a project in Japan trying to do this. And there's a project sitting in one of my laboratories at Holloway working on this. And I showed you data from, from that detector in that CCD image. So this is a very exciting area of detector development. And if you could measure the direction of low energy particle scatters, you could study lots of interesting questions we don't know the answers to. Um, one of the things we don't understand very well is where any of the elements uh, heavier than iron come from. We know how to produce them up to iron in supernovae. Uh, but higher than that, we think are produced in, uh, we know how to, uh, higher than that, we think are produced in, in the shock of supernovae. And we can test that hypothesis um, using this kind of detector potentially. Another big open question um, is in the solar fusion process, <clears throat> we can't quite predict the ratio of elements heavier than helium to the total. 
It's a bit of a puzzle called the metallicity puzzle. And this kind of experiment could potentially resolve that. And finally, the Earth's uh, heat flow, roughly half of it is unexplained. And one hypothesis is that decays of potassium-40 geoneutrinos uh, could be responsible for a significant component. And this kind of measurement could potentially make the first observation of the potassium-40 geoneutrino flux. So developing kind of large mass, low energy threshold detectors that are capable of direction measurement um, is a very interesting challenge that has potential application beyond dark matter. So I'm going to talk now about kind of societal applications for some of the, the major challenges that dark matter addresses. So first of all, dark matter experiments have to detect very small energies. And in noble liquids, the way that works is, you know, the WIMP scatters off the nucleus and then the nucleus travels through the medium, uh, exciting other atoms along its path. And the kind of commonly used liquid nobles that are uh, used for dark matter applications are xenon, argon, and there are even ideas about using neon. And they produce huge numbers of photons per unit of energy deposited. So that's why they're so appealing for measuring small energies. And there are lots of experiments employing this technology. So um, what's shown in the bottom left here is a time projection chamber with you can kind of see somebody's hands on the side. So you can see the scale of it. It's about the height of a person. Um, and it's viewed top and bottom by arrays of photosensors. And then in order to keep this noble liquid liquid, it has to be operated at cryogenic temperatures. So it needs to sit inside of a big cryostat. That's what's shown in the bottom right picture. And then that sits inside of a gigantic shield in order to shield the experiment from neutron backgrounds. And that's what the top right picture shows. So you can sort of see that this object that's about the size of a human, by the time you wrap it up in all of its shielding, is about the height of a three-story building. And then this is operated underneath a mountain at the Gran Sasso Laboratory in Italy in order to shield the detector from environmental radiation. Another type of experiment using liquid nobles is the deep experiment that Stephen showed you a picture of, which is a sphere of liquid argon surrounded by photosensors. That's what you see in the top picture. And then that's enclosed in a big cryostat. And so these are how we produce the largest mass liquid noble detectors. The uh, large, so I showed you kind of those, those curves for the high mass results. The best ones come from xenon and argon targets, where when a dark matter particle interacts, interacts in it, you see two flashes, a prompt flash, S1, and a second flash, S2. And based on those two flashes, we reconstruct the properties of the interaction. And this is how experiments are aiming to reach all the way down to this neutrino floor in sensitivity to dark matter. So why is this interesting for society? Well, what we've developed is ways to measure very small amounts of energy. And so the detection process looks like a particle scattering producing photons. Those photons are shifted by wavelength shifter to visible wavelengths, and then we measure them in something called a photomultiplier tube, which is like an inverse light bulb. So with a, a photomultiplier tube, when photons hit the surface, you get a proportional amount of current at the back, and you measure that charge. And so this spectrum on the right shows the charge measurement for a single photons in a PMT. Other applications where we have to measure small energy deposits are positron emission tomography. So this is a nuclear medicine functional imaging technique which observes the metabolism of a tracer isotope taken by a patient in a tumor in the body. And so this is used for cancer diagnosis and monitoring during treatment. And um, being able to measure smaller energies be means being able to measure tumors earlier. And so there are lots of dark matter research groups that are exploring using liquid nobles for positron emission tomography. And this is a sketch of, of the project that we're working on in my lab <laughs> to try to explore how liquid nobles can improve uh, cancer detection. Another area that dark matter experiments are developing rapidly is in photosensors. So I work on the dark side experiment, which instead of using PMTs is going to use silicon detectors to detect photons. And so uh, this will be the sort of first large-scale use of cryogenic silicon detectors that have a comparable sensing area to PMTs. And this is a device that's shown in somebody's hand. You can see it. It's about 25 square centimeters. Um, and what the charge signal coming out of this detector looks like is shown in the bottom left. And you see you can count, you have peaks where you can count zero, one photon in red, two photons in green, three photons in blue, and so on. And so this has beautiful charge resolution. Um, and the idea with this detector is that we're going to use it to view 50 tons of liquid argon that will search for dark matter in the high mass region that's sort of complementary with where the LHC experiments can look. And so these are very exciting photon detectors that have broad application. And one of the really interesting possibilities is to uh, read these out digitally 
And what's been shown with these types of CIPMs is that you can reach sub nanosecond timing resolution. And the reason that that's important is for light interferometry direct detection and ranging, which is a technique that's used for autonomous navigation. And basically, the higher the precision with which you can measure the photon arrival time, the higher the precision you can image an environment. And so this shows a simulation of an environment. You can see a beach and a bay. And this, the bottom right shows the reconstruction of that environment if you could achieve 10 picosecond timing resolution. So this has huge application for autonomous navigation. And so this is a really exciting field of development. The other kind of key challenge for dark matter experiments is to detect very small concentrations, right? We have to measure tiny, tiny event rates. And so we work very hard to remove all the radioactivity from all our detectors because you can't shield a detector from trace amounts of uranium and thorium that are present inside of detector materials. But the problem is that radioactive daughters and their associated decay particles can mimic dark matter signals. So experiments screen uh, to identify low reactivity materials. And this is an example of all the screening measurements that went into uh, you know, an, an example dark matter experiment. So you can see there's a lot of measurements, lots of work goes into that. And so dark matter experiments have developed new screening techniques. So one that I've worked on is trying to find new ways to measure the presence of lead. So in the deep experiment, we required a concentration of lead 210 that was less than 10 to the minus 21 grams of lead per gram of the acrylic that our detector is made of. And this is a very small number, and it was below the sensitivity of current techniques. So we developed a new method to achieve this. And this actually was a student project. So we built this little detector, and we operated at Bulby Laboratory, and we showed that it worked. So that was very exciting. Um, and one of the reasons lead is interesting is that very low levels of lead are toxic to humans. And so you, you may have heard about the Flint, Michigan lead in the water scandal. Um, where millions of people were exposed to dangerous lead levels many thousands of times above the acceptable limit. And in fact, lead pollution is among the world's worst pollution problems. Um, and so what this, uh, what this plot shows is the sources of lead pollution as a function of time. And what you see is there's kind of exponential growth in lead use for batteries. So this ULAB are lead acid batteries which are even used in electric cars. And so lead acid batteries and lead smelting are very important sources of pollution. Um, and they're particularly uh, damaging for children's public health. And so one of the things that I work on is a collaboration with uh, UNESCO and several institutions in Mexico and Argentina to apply the techniques we've developed for measuring lead in low background experiments to produce new ways to measure lead in drinking water. Um, and so there's some, uh, the project is called Plumbox and uh, it has a very active Facebook and social media page. So if you're interested, that's a place to read more. So this is an example of a societal impact. So I'm gonna finish there and leave you with the thought that as we learn how to see dark matter, we can ask amazing questions. We can learn about the distribution of dark matter in our galaxy. We can ask if there are completely dark galaxies out there in the universe. We can learn about the properties and interactions of the dark matter particles. And we can even ask what's missing from our standard model of particle physics. And I think there's a huge opportunity for global impacts of these developments from medicine to the environment to self-driving cars. So I'll leave you with a quote from Michael Peshkin, which I really like, which is that the study of dark matter promises insights for both the largest and the smallest distance scales in the universe. And I wanna say this is not the work of one person. This is the work of a research group. So on behalf of my research group, thank you very much for your attention.